What's good everybody, it's Karsten Craning. Today we are going to be taking a deep dive into understanding Kanye West's Donda. He just released the album and it's a very interesting piece of art which has all these interesting references to religion and classical literature and is pretty much a retelling of Dante's Inferno. So let's get into that. But before we get into the actual album and art, we want to give some context about Kanye because in analysis we need to truly understand context to understand the art. You wouldn't talk about World War II without talking about World War I first. And in the same way, we aren't gonna talk about Kanye West Donda without understanding who Kanye is and the role that Donda West played in his life. So to get into it, Kanye West was raised in the suburbs of Chicago by his mother Donda West. His mother was a professor of English at Chicago State University, so he was raised in the environment of middle class academia. Kanye always had a talent and interest in art, which would be translated into a love of hip hop. Kanye started making beats in his late teenage years and quickly rose to prominence even dropping out of college and was soon working for many of his heroes such as Jay-Z and writing hit songs for them. Kanye's aspiration, however, wasn't to be a producer, but it was to be a rapper. But at the time, he was quickly shut down by everybody because he didn't have the background nor appearance of a successful rapper at that time. Kanye wasn't from a low income area and he wasn't a gangster rapper, which was pretty much the only successful rapper at that time. Instead, Kanye was this kind of artsy, middle-class kid who cared way too much about his clothes, specifically polo, Louis Vuitton, etc., etc., which none of the labels believed at that time that that kind of image would sell. They'd never seen anything before like that. And the only reason Kanye was actually signed to Rockefeller Records was to keep him at that label writing music for other artists, not because they believed in him as a solo artist. Over this time, Donda West was Kanye's biggest and only supporter in some senses. It was the one person Kanye knew that truly believed in him. Kanye eventually released The College Dropout, which became a hit and quickly led him into the spotlight. Kanye's first years would not be without controversy, of course, as well as success, and this will be a pattern. There's, of course, the infamous George Bush doesn't care about black people, but the bigger deal was is that Kanye is not your typical rapper. While his second album was also a success, these years were still filled with a doubt that Kanye could actually be successful over an extended period of time without being a gangster rapper. This all culminated into the release of Kanye's third project, Graduation, which was pinned against 50 Cent's album releasing at the same time. This was a big deal because, of course, 50 was the biggest rapper at the time, fit more into the profile of what a successful rapper at that time looked like, and Kanye was still kind of this obscure but successful kid that was kind of seen as an anomaly. This kind of cultural battle was created to see whoever could sell the most records, it was a competition, and this moment would determine if there would be this shift in hip-hop culture as well as if Kanye West had any longevity. Kanye ended up outselling 50 Cent and he would become widely accepted as one of the biggest forces in hip-hop, fashion, and culture as a whole. This victory would be bittersweet for Kanye though, as only two months after, his mother Donda would tragically pass away. Kanye's biggest supporter over his whole life, and especially when everyone else doubted him, would be taken right from him, just as things were starting to get good. From here we see a shift in how Kanye would start to do things as an artist where he would become extremely good at evolving. I would argue there is no artist that is able to evolve and master a new vision so quickly like Kanye West. With every album there would be a new sweep of sound, fashion, imagery, and trends that would severely affect culture until the next album dropped. Oftentimes it feels like however that Kanye is making these albums so great in order to escape the public outcry against him, giving the public something so good that they are forced to put the missteps in the back of their mind. This is certainly the case with My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, which is a direct response to the Taylor Swift controversy. Kanye's art would be triumphant and extremely influential over these next couple of years from 808s all the way to the life of Pablo. The worlds he created with his music would go on to earn him the title of the greatest artist alive for many. He would go on to marry Kim Kardashian and start Yeezy, which would become one of the best-selling clothing brands of the 2010s. That is, until the end of the life of Pablo Tour, where he would be hospitalized for having a mental breakdown. Kanye would go pretty silent 
from 2016, 2017 into 2018, where he reemerged going on a rant to TMZ. During this era, Kanye would then go on to release five projects which he produced, including Ye and Kid See Ghost. In these albums, Kanye would go on to show his more vulnerable side, including his struggles with mental health, but also things would become more sporadic and brief. Both Ye and Kid See Ghosts are only about 20 minute albums, and while they're both great projects, they make Kanye feel a bit aged. One of the things Kanye is great is pushing the new sound, ushering in the next generation, and these short vignettes of Kanye's life just aren't as grand or artistically ambitious as his previous projects. In this era, Kanye's artistic vision would seem to stumble but not fall completely. In this era, Kanye would also start a beef or a cold war with Drake, which would go on to result in a lot of sneak disses on Drake's record for the next three years almost constantly. Kanye would then go on to have a lot of more awkward moments in the media than his music could make up for, including supporting Trump, going on rants on SNL, and this all culminated into the release of his last record, Jesus is King. Kanye from these very tumultuous years would go on to become a born-again Christian and release Jesus is King, which is unfortunately probably his worst album. I can already hear comments coming about Jesus is King, so let me just say this. I think the, song, the album has good songs here and there, but comparing it to the artistry of any other project is like comparing the Vatican to your personal log cabin, where Jesus is King is the log cabin. Cabin. The log cabin might be great, you might have a lot of great personal memories in it, and it might mean a lot more to you than the Vatican does, but your log cabin is not going down in history as a great artistic or architectural feat. Kanye would then go, go on to run for president, go on Joe Rogan, and then go silent, and for the past months and years, Kanye has felt like a ghost where we know little about him. He isn't pushing into the world this great art as much as he used to, and when the media has seen him, it's been leading him to become ostracized more and more. We finally learned earlier this year that he would be divorcing his wife, Kim Kardashian. It could be argued that Kanye is in the darkest place he ever has been because before, when he would stumble in the media, we would have this great vision and art that would make it clear in a way. But it doesn't seem like we have that anymore. With all that being said, that now leads us to Donda. Now, what is exactly Donda? I would say for sure it's an album, but on top of that, it's one of the most important and interesting pieces of performance art we have seen in a while. What Kanye did is he created an amazing story, and with these three live performances that are extremely fascinating, it's essential to understanding what Kanye is trying to say with this album. But also proves that he isn't gone yet in a way, he still has a lot to say, and while this whole project may not be perfect, it is still genius in many senses. <laughs> Let's get into the album first before we get into the story, and I want to say there are a few major themes throughout the album. The first being God and Christianity. This has always been an essential part of Kanye's music from Jesus Walks to Ultralight Beam. However, Christianity in Kanye's life has gone from being in the backseat to driving the whole last car. So with this album, most everything is related to God. Everything is from a Christian perspective. And while I would say before Kanye albums were about him and only him, God has almost become a second character in a way, or like he is collabing with God, kind of like he cheekily did on the track list of Yeezus. Um, so every song is not only about Kanye and Kanye alone, but Kanye and his relationship to God. The second major theme is prison, grace, redemption. This is in terms of mental, figurative type prisons and quite literal prisons. The idea of being locked in a place of hardship or prison for your wrongdoing, your sin, your evil, is a mental and figurative idea with how Kanye has been treated by the media. He does something in the public eye that is wrong and he's put in a box and punished for it. Being in the public eye to the extent that Kanye is or any other celebrity of his status for that matter means that your actions are not only judged by the court and legal system of the country you are in, but also by the public who becomes a second judge, jury, and executioner in a way. Whether that is for better or for worse is beyond me, but stick with me a little bit if that whole thing sounds a bit self-conceited as a theme and overly boohoo for Kanye and celebrities, because there is also the idea of quite literal, physical prisons in this album. The prison system in America is one of the largest issues we need to talk about. If you haven't read this book right here, When They Call You a Terrorist by Patrice, Patrice Cons Colores, 
I would highly recommend it. It's an easy read, it's heartbreaking, and it illustrates how purely fucked up the prison system is in America. This is, that's the system that has plagued minority groups, particularly the black community, and it is one of the biggest issues we need to get educated on as a society. And Kanye speaks a lot about literal prisons and the justice system on this album. It's a major theme, um, particularly on songs like Jail, Jesus is Lord, where Kanye has one of the best and most introspective verses in his career with some amazing storytelling. It's really almost Kendrick level, his verse on Jesus is Lord. So on this theme, we have the idea of breaking away from these metaphorical prisons, but also confronting the issue of our own justice system and the population that has been stuck in literal prisons. Third theme is Kim Kardashian and his family as a whole. Kanye has gone through a divorce in the past year, and while I think a lot of people expected this to kind of haunt Kanye on the album, it doesn't haunt Kanye as much as I think expected. While there's definitely pain in it, it's not as bitter as 808s. It's more introspective and mature, and to me this airs more on the side of healing. War slash Drake beef. Kanye's music is often aggressive, particularly Yeezus or The Life of Pablo, and his last three projects have lacked that type of aggression in Kanye's music. This album is kind of a revival of that aggression and grit like there was on Yeezus. One of the reasons this album is so aggressive is because of Drake. I would be willing to bet there are a lot more sneak disses than the public will ever know, because the way Drake has made these references is really clever, but they aren't for the public as much as they are for Kanye specifically. The bars on sicko mode are so hyper specific that it took the internet uh, quite a while before people realized that it was a Kanye sneak diss. So ever since Drake lost the Pusha T beef, he has been taunting Kanye with every chance he gets. So on this record, there are a number of Drake disses as well as this aggression. Um, this all culminated into an Instagram post where Kanye told off Drake and quite literally added Pusha T to the chat. And from our understanding, Kanye and Drake are not settling this in the classic hip-hop beef way, bar for bar, diss track for diss track. Um, instead, when we look at Kanye's beef in the past, he usually doesn't fight with words. Instead, he fights with artistic output and sales. He did this back when Graduation released, where he won that competition by outselling 50 Cent. And numbers mean a lot to Drake, and Drake is definitely more lyrical, but the numbers mean everything to Drake. And so, from my understanding and assumption, the way they're settling this is through the numbers, who sells more albums, and releasing their albums the same week. And the last major theme on Donda is Donda herself, um, Kanye's mother and guide. Let's break this down into what the story of Donda is from both the performance art and the album. The story that Kanye is trying to tell here is some sort of twisted, updated version of Dante's Divine Comedy, where Kanye, like Dante, is not only narrating this poetry, but is the main character going on this journey through hell, purgatory, and into finally heaven. Kanye has heavily been influenced by Dante in the past, before most recognizable through the Yeezus live performance, which also had some sort of Dante-esque journey. But now he's greatly expanding and updating that theme as Kanye does. So now let's dive deep into the one issue that I already see people commenting about how the album wasn't complete during the first listening party and there is no way that Kanye planned this. That doesn't matter. Art evolved so much last minute behind the scenes. If you want any proof of this, watch any documentary on an artist where oftentimes it is the night before that the art is supposed to be presented where the artists do their best work. Um, and what a great artist does is he's able to take an incomplete situation and make it complete. So while he may have not have planned this to the get-go, or he might have, he did turn it into something that fits thematically, and now we have these final two performances at least, which seem a lot more intentional. Also, the track list, of course, does change order throughout the performances, but I think the two most important focal points is the Don to Champ being towards the beginning and in the final album being the first song on the track list, and then finally No Child left behind being the final song. The story of Donda, this divine comedy, is packed through all kinds of religious and classical art references, so let's just kind of get into it. Donda, 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 
Donda. Let's start off with the Donda chant because this is one of the most important parts of the album. The Donda chant is the repeating of Don, the name Donda at various places. When you hear it, it's going at different speeds. It's supposed to mirror a heartbeat. Donda, 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 Donda. It's a heartbeat that's fluctuating very quickly from beating very fast to beating very slow. And it's ultimately supposed to mirror the heartbeat that happened of the death of his mother. It's a dark moment and importantly, Donda is chanted exactly 58 times to mirror the 58 years that Donda was alive. Most important, however, is that this isn't a song, but a chant. It's a ritual in many ways. In the ancient world, words had power, particularly names had immense power. In the ancient Hebrew world, they wouldn't dare to utter the name of the God, Yahweh, unless they truly needed to. Because that word had power, that name had power. When you cried out the real true name of God, you were calling him, you were summoning him. And if you're to summon God and bring his attention towards you, you better have a good reason because God is a busy man with a lot on his plate. It's the reason that the second commandment in the Bible is you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God because names were so important that it was the second biggest rule. But when you attach repetition and symbolism, they become so much more powerful. Numbers were used as symbolism constantly in the ancient world. The best example of this is in numerology, where numbers represent characters or ideas, and they hold those numbers hold that power that the name would. Almost in the same way that when I say 24 and 8, some of you right off the bat are thinking of Kobe, where numbers represent concepts, people, but in a much more elevated way in that culture. But the repetition of names and combining it with this idea that numbers hold power is extremely powerful and sacred. Another example in the Bible where Kanye is taking a lot of these ideas is that after one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, denounces Jesus, the way he makes it right is by repeating this phrase three times. And three would come to represent the number of God, the Trinity. And so repeating the phrase three times holds a lot of power. These phrases, names, hold power, especially when combined with uh, sacred number ideas. So what Kanye is doing here is he's using this very ancient idea not only to create a song, but rather a chant and to metaphorically or spiritually summon his mother Donda to be his guide on this journey. In Dante's Inferno, when Dante goes on this journey, his guide is Virgil, and not Virgil Abloh, the creative director of Louis Vuitton, Kanye's apprentice, but Virgil the poet. Virgil in Dante's time was considered the most moral poet and one of the greatest, even though he was a pagan. But his work really laid the groundwork for Dante not only to create this crazy, beautiful artistic journey, but also for that art to be some sort of moral foundation for society to benefit off of. Then we get to Kanye West and Donda. Similarly, Donda was a professor of English, someone in the arts who guided Kanye not only to have an appreciation of the arts, but to make his own. Donda was Kanye's guide when she was alive. She was his biggest supporter, but also guiding his moral framework. This is especially evidence in the samples that Kanye uses on this album. Kanye uses samples of his late mother's that are excerpts of her reading poetry and talking about how proud she is of her son being in this sort of line of great art as a whole. So Donda is to Kanye as Virgil is to Dante. Dante's Inferno can really be boiled down to a man's journey to find salvation, redemption, and it begins in hell, which is the first listening party for Kanye. So here we are at the first act of this three-act stage play, which is supposed to be hell. We all have expectations of what hell should look like. But when we get to this first act of Kanye's depiction of hell, it's just a blank white stage with him alone in full red. It's just him fumbling around chaotically about in nothingness. I think we all kind of think there's no way that this can be hell. There's no fire, there's no brimstone, there's no demons, etc. And for sure, it does not look like Dante's hell. But I think we need to take a step back and think to ourselves what hell is. Most of what we think of hell today in our culture actually comes from Dante himself. It's, dr it's a dramatic place where demons torture people, there are nine layers, people hold their leads, all sorts of crazy, creepy stuff. But when Dante wrote Inferno, he was never intending to make a version of hell that was accurate to Christian or Hebrew theology. He made his hell to be an artistic statement 
on how different types of evil are evil in reference to each other. It's a horrifying place to get that imagery across. The actual imagery Dante uses is nowhere in Christian nor Hebrew theology, but rather the Greek depiction of their afterlife, Hades. And it's just better to use that dramatic imagery for the message Dante was trying to get across with his art. Dante's depiction, because it was so creative and dramatic and good, it became our image of hell. But that early Hebrew and Christian depictions of an afterlife or hell are quite different. In Hebrew, the word for the afterlife was Sheol, which was just the place in the afterlife where everyone goes and waits to be judged. That's pretty much it. In early Christianity, that idea was expanded on where hell, specifically, is a place where people who have been judged or fall short of God or being a good person go. And this is where the idea that hell is a bad place comes from. It's a place where you go to get punished. Oftentimes, the term the lake of fire is used, but early Christian writers and theologians didn't really depict hell as this dramatic, fiery place as much as it's simply being a place without God or God's blessing. Hell in the most biblically accurate way of describing is just a place without God. So what is God for Kanye? Well, God is everything for Kanye. For Kanye without God, he wouldn't have anything. None of his success, none of his lavish shows, none of his friends or family. And that's how we are forced to see Kanye in this depiction of hell, with nothing, it's just an empty space. Kanye out alone. This also ties back into the theme of jail as hell is this place where you are punished. And one of the most cruel punishments in our prison system in jail is total isolation. No human contact, no one around you like Kanye in this show. One of the reasons total isolation is so cruel is because you have no distractions and no other people to surround yourself with. You have no one to distract yourself with and you really have to live with yourself. And this practice is considered inhumane and many people in total isolation have gone insane and suffered horrible mental health repercussions because of it. Living with yourself and yourself alone is a really hard thing to do. You have to reflect on yourself, your actions, and I think many of us who have gone through the COVID stay at home orders and isolations have experienced this in some capacity as we have a generation began to understand this concept not like many others before. Kanye in his depiction of hell is showing us this. Hell is a place without God, where we are forced to reckon with ourselves in isolation. And we are forced to look back at every mistake. Kanye's hell is perfect because we just have Kanye. We don't have any of the cool stuff or people that Kanye usually has because this is a place without God or God's blessing. And we are forced to see Kanye for who he really is, his own actions, and like Kanye, forced to wrestle with that. Our minds, like Kanye, in complete isolation don't usually lean to the good parts of ourselves. Humanity is twisted in that we are passionately in love with suffering. And when you look back at your own actions, it's much easier to be critical and look at the dark parts, the mistakes. And when we look at Kanye in total isolation, we look at the Kanye who he's been in the past few years. We think of the divorce, the comments on TMZ, etc., etc. It's hard to see his best parts when he's utterly alone and there's no grand spectacle. Kanye's depiction of hell definitely isn't as dramatic as Dante's, but it's probably more accurate and terrifying than any of us want to admit. Also, Kanye is wearing red, red garments um, representing blood and being guilty or sin. Kanye wearing this might be an admission of his own guilt. Also, huge note, Kanye is masked through all three events which he has done before, particularly on the Yeezus tour. The difference is, is that on the Yeezus tour, Kanye said, talked, said things, and great things like, We should've never ever let Michael Jordan play for the Wizards. But here he is completely silent, which for Kanye is insane. We can't not link him with talking, with saying things, etc., etc. And this is inspired by Martin Margiela, who did the masks for the Yeezus tour, but notably would also put masks in on his own models and wouldn't give public statements or be seen himself. Kanye is practicing a sort of Margiela-like anonymity. For Martin, this was to take the idea of celebrity culture, which was rampant in fashion at the time, and separate it from his art. And it made his art tenfold times more powerful. Instead of seeing Margiela or any of the cool models at his shows, you just saw the art itself, and that spoke enough. 
Margiela is one of Kanye's heroes, and to see him do this is really interesting because it has a similar effect for Kanye, where we don't see his reactions in real time, or we don't hear him talking, we just see his art. And it makes his art a lot more interesting. But Kanye with Donda as his guide is able to move from hell to the next stage, the next act, purgatory. Now what is purgatory? Purgatory is the place where you work and you fight your way into redemption and to be saved. It's the middle place between heaven and hell, and that's exactly what Kanye does in this next stage. Before the actual event, Kanye would live stream himself and others working on the album. With Donda as his guide, he's still working on completing this album. He's working to fight his way towards redemption. As the show is beginning, we see the stage set up and it's initially red lighting with the white floor. This is kind of marks the transition from heaven to hell, and as the lighting goes up, the red fades away. This staging setup, specifically here, it also curiously looks to me very similar to Earth After the Third Impact in Neon Genesis Evangelion. Kanye is a huge anime fan, and Neon Genesis has a lot of religious imagery in it, so I wouldn't be surprised if this is a reference. It's a bit more subtle. Earth after the third impact is supposed to be pretty much the calm after the storm. It's the place after the hellish events of the third impact. Also, Kanye is pretty much Asuka from Neon Genesis. There's no difference between the two, they're just the same person. And so when we get to the actual show, the stage is set up to mirror the place where Kanye worked to create the album. It's just the humble room where he spent those nights in the stadium working to complete the album. The room doesn't have much but the bare essentials that Kanye needs. I think that reflects on the idea of purgatory well. It isn't hell where we have nothing, but it certainly isn't heaven with no luxuries. This is a humble place where you have what you need to work. In the Divine Comedy, Dante is tasked with writing the Divine Comedies as one of his ways to achieve salvation by living out his calling, and Kanye is doing the same thing. In purgatory, what Kanye is doing is working towards creating his own divinely inspired work of art to achieve salvation. Now what we have, of course, is the space for Kanye to work and sleep and etc. But surrounding the circle, we also have supporters in a way. They aren't with Kanye, he's still isolated in a way, but not completely. This isn't hell, he has people cheering him on. He has people guarding him, but they aren't 100% there. Now let's take a look at what Kanye is wearing. It's all black and he's wearing a bulletproof vest with Donda's name on it. It's very militaristic and the people in the crowd reflect on that as they're also wearing all black and kind of this military themed clothing. And that's because part of the theme of Donda, again, is this war, this aggression. There is a similar aggression in Dante's Divine Comedy, interestingly enough. A similar aggression where Dante ends up dissing the Pope and a lot of political figures because he believed they had wronged God. And I think Kanye is doing something similar against maybe Drake and our society as a whole. There's definitely a number of Drake sneak disses on this album because in Kanye's mind, Drake has wronged Kanye and pretty much turned his circle against him. But I also think this theme of fighting and war can pertain to the idea of fighting for prison reform. Kanye is making this project partially to fight against the injustices in our justice system. And now with Donda, someone known for being Kanye's moral guide, donning the names of these uniforms, showing us that this is a war guided by the spirit of Donda for something moral, something important. Also a note, much of the visuals for this show and the costumes were made by Dimna Gasvalia of Balenciaga and formerly Vemos. Dimna worked for Margiela and is one of Kanye's favorite collaborators. Dimna often does things in a similar way and is seen as a successor of Margiela, and it could also be implied that there is a parallel of Dante and Virgil with Dimna and Margiela. Also, one of the interesting things that Kanye wore during this show was this jacket, which was made by Dimna at Balenciaga. It's based off of a suit of spikes, which was rumored to be for fighting bears in Siberia. That's not its actual purpose, its actual purpose is unknown, but it's an interesting costume choice because you cannot get close or touch Kanye when he is wearing it. So this means two things for his time in purgatory. One, his enemies can't touch him. He's protected when he's in purgatory. He's in God's grace to, to a degree. However, no one close to Kanye can also touch him. He's still separated from his loved ones and their embrace at this stage. So it's a double-edged sword, this jacket. It's protection, but it also keeps the ones he loves away from him. 
And so it's the perfect metaphor for where Kanye is on his journey, protected enough by God where he can do his work, but not experiencing life in full. So as the album and the show comes to close, we see the work that Kanye has put in to redeem himself pay off. As No Child Left Behind begins to get played, we see Kanye rise up through the Mercedes-Benz Stadium and into heaven. It's a crazy moment and No Child Left Behind is the close of the album that's supposed to symbolize Kanye's ascension and redemption in a way into heaven. The term No Child Left Behind, interestingly enough, actually comes from a George Bush policy which was about raising the standard standards of education. That policy failed, but Kanye is using this term in an ironic twist, and he is using it to describe how God leaves none of his children behind, particularly his children who have been forgotten and imprisoned. With that, we get to the final part of this journey, which is heaven. Now, very important note, just getting to heaven is not the goal or salvation for either Kanye or Dante there's still a journey to be taken in both accounts. In Paradiso, Dante talks to many individuals and goes on a cosmic journey where eventually he meets God who tells him the secret of salvation. For Kanye, he still has this journey once he gets to heaven as well. Kanye, of course, has an artistic depiction of heaven that differs from Dante's. For Dante, heaven is the realm of the galaxy, each planet being a different realm of heaven, and Kanye depicts his heaven as being him and his mother's childhood home in Chicago. It's an exact recreation of the actual house, with the only difference is there being a cross on the top. It's on a hill with a lot of candles and lights, and it is entrenched in a circle. It's extremely symbolic not only to have this show in Chicago, his hometown, but also for his depiction of heaven to be his childhood home. What Kanye is trying to say is that heaven is not only a place of comfort, but it's also his home. And it's also where Donda is. Now when the show starts, the house begins to light up with beams, and this is a very important note because all over Dante's depiction of heaven is light. It's a central motif in Dante's Divine Comedy where lights get brighter and brighter the further he gets into heaven. So starting this off, the light is bright, but it's not as bright as it's gonna get with Kanye. And the music starts and Kanye steps out and who is with him but Marilyn Manson and DaBaby. Now let me pause. For a second so I can say I hate this obviously this is an intentional artistic choice and it's not just me who is upset by this and it is extremely disrespectful to the victims and the families who have been affected by both people's actions if you follow me on Twitter you know I was upset by this but we have to dive into this because it's important Kanye wanted to disgust us with this he wanted to upset us it's like a lot of other artists in the past have used depictions of Hitler or Charles Manson in their work, and those two figures have lost their sting because we've been desensitized to them. So Kanye is bringing these two figures into heaven instead because they sting today. But why? One person on Twitter made the comparison that it might symbolize the two sinners who were having to be crucified next to Jesus, which is interesting, but I don't think that's what Kanye wants to say. I think it's obvious that Kanye is trying to play into the theme of redemption and that anyone can get it, and that is why these are the first two figures we see in heaven. Let's also look at the person of Jesus who also spoke of redemption, and it's well known he didn't hang out with people who were good people. He hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, the two types of worst people in society in ancient times. Who does Kanye himself surround himself with? Well, two of the worst people our society also shuns. Now, why did the person of Jesus do that? Well, the idea was if the worst people in society can be redeemed and find forgiveness, then everyone else can. So if Kanye can bring these two people to be redeemed in some sense in his depiction of heaven, then so can everyone else in our society. I don't think this is much of a criticism of cancel culture as it is a criticism of our society as a whole. Our society has upheld a broken justice system for years with lots of people who haven't been redeemed or seen grace that they deserve at this point. This whole thing is also very interesting because both of these men are the inverse of, Con of Kanye. The baby was outed for being homophobic and Kanye was one of the very first artists in hip hop to speak against homophobia in hip hop culture. Marilyn Manson spent his whole career being an outspoken critic of religion and would you often use satanic imagery, the exact opposite of Kanye right now. And it's very strange and somewhat ironic that this guy, Marilyn Manson, who used satanic imagery all over his career, and the last project we will ever probably see him be a part of is an overtly Christian album. So the idea might be if Kanye can accept these two into heaven, 
to be redeemed, why can't we in our society give grace and redeem those in our prison system? There are a lot of people in prison who, of course, who deserve to be there. But there are also a lot of people who have done something, but they no longer deserve to suffer the consequences of it because laws have changed, mandatory minimums, and the lifelong brand of being a felon. And then there are a lot of people in our prison system who just should have never been there in the first place. Take that explanation with what you will. I'm offering an explanation. I'm not justifying. Because personally for me, I'm not sure that this artistic statement can be justified when you think about the victims and the families of Marilyn Manson in particular, but it's my job to make an analysis of this, and this is a part of it, so it has to be in the video. But, so a huge point of heaven is more people join Kanye on the actual stage. We have West Side Gun, Travis Scott, the list goes on. This is a big deal because this is the first time we see Kanye with other people, with collaborators, and this is of course represented representative of heaven being a place where you benefit from God's blessing, and one of those blessings just being the presence of others. He doesn't have to be alone anymore on this journey. Now let's talk about Kanye's costume or clothes. He's still masked, but he isn't in a military uniform anymore. It's civilian clothes, and what, from what I understand, it's by Dimna, and it looks incredibly normal compared to what Kanye would normally wear. Of course it's by Dimna, so it's very expensive, but what Dimna often does is he makes clothes that do not look very fashionable. Dimna's clothes aren't elegant, and they don't look very fashion-y in many senses. They are often designed to look awkward in a way. And Kanye loves Dimna for this, but he usually doesn't go this far into Dimna's direction. To be honest, with this outfit or costume, you could replace Kanye's face with somebody else. And I would bet that this is a person on the street who doesn't care about fashion and probably works a blue collar job, etc, etc. Just doesn't seem like Kanye West. So why would Kanye be wearing this? There's a very clear teaching in Christianity that those who are rich and are first in the world will be last and humbled in heaven. And so a man like Kanye West who has lived a life of luxury and is known for his importance is going to be humbled in heaven. So I think Kanye is bringing some self-awareness to this, that heaven isn't going to be a luxurious place because he received blessings in his life on earth, but it'll still be heaven. Kanye accepts that because he recognizes there's something greater than his lifestyle or luxury, and that's to be with God, his mother, and the people he loves. And that is luxury to a man like Kanye West. As the performance goes on, we have what looks like an army of Kanye's circling the stage, and it's a crazy performance with multiple rings, and this is a calling card to Dante, as in Paradise, there is an army of angels which are formed into multiple rings that sort of circle heaven, just as there is an army of Kanye's all brandishing the Donda uniform. Towards the end of Kanye's performance, there's a great light in a circle surrounding Kanye that is lit up and it gets brighter and brighter. And then Kanye West is lit on fire, engulfed in flames, and then he marries Kim Kardashian. What on earth does all this mean? Well, let's take it back to Dante. When Dante gets to the final part of heaven, he meets God. And the way God is depicted is these giant circles of blinding lights with the Bible in the middle. So Kanye sees the giant flash of light, the giant circles surrounding the house, and this could be seen as God. And then Dante is told by God the secret of how to become redeemed. And then we can only assume that when Kanye also meets God, it's the same. So Kanye lets himself get lit on fire. Many have drawn the comparison to Kanye being Jesus, which is interesting, but I don't think this is it. Jesus was not lit on fire, he's put on a cross, and I also think we're out of the era where Kanye thinks he is God. I don't know if Kanye ever truly thought he was Jesus in the first place. So then why is Kanye West on fire? Well, it's martyrdom. He isn't lighting himself on fire physically, it's not suicide. But he also isn't fighting either, he's accepting his death, it's martyrdom. What martyrdom is, is to die for a cause or a concept. In Christianity, it's to die for God. Kanye's martyrdom here draws parallels to the martyrdom of Polycarp in particular. Polycarp was a very important person in early Christianity. He's not as popular today as other martyrs, but he was one of the most important at the time. And there's a lot of interesting parallels here. Polycarp refused to worship the emperor and instead claimed there was only one god, Christ. He was called and branded a liar because at the time, to speak that the emperor was not god was a lie. It was a great crime. 
and for that he was burned alive. It was some sort of miracle where his death was graceful even as he was burned alive, that it was revealed that there was no way he could have been lying, and it revealed his true self. Accounts of it at the time said he baked like bread instead of burning to death, um, which is a strange comparison and it doesn't really make sense to me. But the point is it revealed not only God, but to all those who watched Polycarp, it revealed that Christians were more powerful or in touch with something divine and so the story goes. So Polycarp is burned and what does this do? It reveals the truth of who he really is to the world. He isn't a liar. Kanye is burnt and something very similar happens. It's the one moment in this entire three act play or performance where Kanye takes off his mask and reveals his true self. And there he is, smiling, something we wouldn't expect from Kanye in this moment. I think everyone expected Kanye to be ultra serious in this moment, but no, he's smiling. He's revealing his true self and who is he? He's happy. The marriage of, to Kim Kardashian parallels Dante. In that Paradiso or in Heaven, Dante is able to meet his lover Beatrice. Um, there's a difference here in which Beatrice is his guide throughout the story of Paradiso, while Kim is kind of shown at this end goal after he, Kanye is able to achieve redemption. Dante comes to understand what it means to be redeemed and find love, and so does Kanye after he's redeemed and martyred, and he's then able to also find love in his family and Kim Kardashian. But why does Kanye have to be martyred to find his, and why doesn't Dante? Well, what I think he is trying to say with that is this. What I think Kanye is trying to say is in order to gain redemption in the society where we have so many that need to be freed from this idea of prison, there needs to be small sacrifices or martyrdoms on our part. It may not be as dramatic as lighting ourselves on fire, but art expresses itself in dramatic forms in order to show a greater idea. In society in which there's so much injustice, some of us will have to put either our sense of pride or sense of security behind us. Fun fact is that most felons can't get a job out of prison. This is a uniquely American problem. And while, so while many of them are trying to put their past behind them, they can't because they can't get a job to make money. It's not because they don't want to get a job, but many organizations don't hire felons because it's a risk they don't want to take. When you can't make money legally, what do you do? It requires a business to sacrifice security to hire a felon. It shouldn't, but it does. That takes sacrifice on a real person's part to potentially have a problem with their business, with their money, with their security, but at the same time, it can provide another person's redemption. So what is Kanye trying to explain to us? It's that through martyrdom, through potential sacrifice, is where our society can find redemption. Kanye has to be martyred, he has to potentially give up his life in order to achieve love and to find redemption and to be with his family, to marry Kim Kardashian. There has to be a willing to sacrifice in order to gain redemption. That's what I think this whole project is about. In order for us to be freed from whether it's mental prisons or the freeing of our society from this issue of physical prisons, it's all about sacrifices and potential martyrdom that we need to be willing to take. And so that's really the end of the story for the most part, but I can already hear people asking about the Drake beef because it's a major theme of the album and it's a huge part of our culture right now as a whole. And at the time of writing this and recording this, Drake released his album, it's good. It's not his best work, but it's also certainly not his worst. And people like it because they're hits and that's what Drake does, he makes hits. And at this point, because it's mainly about who sells the most records, I don't know who will win. But for me, it doesn't matter. I don't think it should matter for you either. The two albums don't compare. And they shouldn't, because Drake went out to make a record with the intention to make hits. And Kanye made this. Of course, it's going to be successful because it's Drake, and I won't lie there, I enjoyed a good number of the songs on it. But I didn't have a strong emotional response to any of them. I didn't have to think, and I wasn't made in any sense uncomfortable, except maybe the song where Drake said he was a lesbian. And let me make this clear, not all art has to be challenging to be great. I think if you're reading this, it's too late by Drake, or a lot of his earlier work are perfect examples of that. But I think what Kanye did here will be remembered for a long time. It's a true feat. It's interesting. It's challenging to a sense. I don't know if everyone's 
going to pick up on how challenging the message might be. And I don't think the Drake album has the same weight that this one will have in 10 years. And I don't think anyone should really care. With both albums, you can enjoy them both. They're both good. But I think one clearly has a grander artistic vision to it, and the other does not. At the end of the day, I don't think I could make a video like this on the Drake album. That's just how it is. So, if you want my thoughts on that, there you go. Um, I want to know what your guys' thoughts are on this album. If this is your first time watching, welcome. Um, and please subscribe to me, uh, like the video, share it if you found this interesting or enjoyable. And, um, my name is Carson Craney. You can follow me on Instagram, Spotify, etc. Um, and you guys have a great day. Thank you.